Good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk with you about uh, the discovery of some DNA aftermarket probes for Frog Virus 3. A lot of material I'm going to be covering is going to sound somewhat familiar after the previous presentation. So, to start off with, what is rhinovirus? Rhinovirus is a genus of double stranded DNA virus. Uh, it specifically targets reptiles, amphibians, and bony fish species. Should have turned off Messenger before this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Give me a second to remedy this, because I don't think we need pop-ups through this. Especially proprietary ones for Vincent. Thought I did all the uh, turn off before. What do you know? Alright. Oh, the Zoom. Um, Uta and Sasha, they're currently in the Zoom, but nothing is connecting. I'm just forgetting everything you like. So, I don't know how many of you know Tamara, but Tamara, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? And Corbin now oh, works with Tamara. Yes, yeah. We, yeah, we are both working at InSmed, so I'm a scientist there, and um, I once, Sorry, like, a while ago, I went to Montclair, and we were looking for a research assistant, and uh, I went to a career event, and that's where I met Corbin, and I already knew a little bit about him um, from Dr. Goody, and he would, was a great fit, and uh, we were really happy when he accepted the position that we offered. So he's been with us now for six months. Yeah, I think yeah. it's been six months. Yeah, six Might months. Might be seven going on yeah. now. I don't know off the top of my head. And he's a great help. He works really hard. Um, is on top of all of his projects. So it's been a pleasure to have him. All right, I'm going to backtrack a bit <laughs> since I forgot to <laughs> pull this up for ever. <laughs> I think it shows how like the whole uh, connecting with the thing, connected with the alumni, like really pays off for both sides, the alumni and the students. So okay. everyone who's here who's a student should make sure they do that. To uh, deal with this, but Sasha just gave you the thumbs up. He's seeing the presentation now. If you, it'll change what they can see in Zoom though. So if you go to more, you can eliminate that bar on the bottom. And now I'm uh, yeah, causing new problems. Okay, I think we're all set up this time. <laughs> So backtracking a bit. Hello everyone, I'm Corbin Hudson. I'm going to be talking to you about the discovery of some DNA after probes as a means of detecting rhinovirus in both wild and commercial populations. So to start off with, what is rhinovirus? Rhinovirus is a genus of double-stranded DNA virus. targets reptiles, amphibians, and bony fish species. It's found globally, so if you look at the map on the right here, all of those purple regions are areas in which some species of rhinovirus has been detected. It's a global threat, not just localized to the Americas. Um, local threats include one variant, which is known as frog virus 3, which has been found in New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia. Uh, it's linked to die-offs in both commercial and uh, natural populations, so it's a big threat wherever it does pop. Infections with rhinovirus inhibit host DNA production, leading to rapid cell death in infected populations. Uh, the inhibition of host DNA production leads to the formation of lesions, hemorrhaging, erythema, and death. Uh, on the right there, you can see the production, the progress of erythema in a frog species, leading to the gradual reddening at different stages of infection. Being both widespread and prevalent, uh, it's a major issue because the virus currently has no cure. So, some of the current issues, as mentioned, rhinoviruses are widespread, prevalent, and have no known cure. So it's very important we have a means of identifying an infected host. Uh, detection methods are needed to both uh, monitor and quarantine populations when necessary, or even call them in commercial populations. Current detection methods include tissue culturing, PCR, and histopathology. All of these run into some issues in the form of they need skilled individuals, specialized equipment, 
or the transport of samples from wild or commercial populations to a lab and then time to actually run the testing. Because of this, there is a need for a simple detection method that can be brought to both wild and commercial populations for easy, reliable results. Our proposed method of doing this is through the use of actinomers. So, what are actinomers? You probably remember a bit from the previous conversation, but we're going to go into it anyway. So, actinomers are single-stranded DNA sequences that form that have unique folding patterns. They have a sort of lock and key fit with their target. Uh, they're highly specific and very stable at different temperatures or have a high shelf life, as we previously mentioned. So how do you find them? One of the most popular ways of finding aphomers is through the use of a technique called CELIX, the Systematic Evolution of Ligands by Exponential Enrichment. We will never be referring to it by its full name again, again after this point. <laughs> uh, this method takes a large randomized library and attempts to bind it to a target molecule. Any type of target molecule could be a virus, could be a protein, could be just about anything. Uh, and you partition off any bound actomers for further enrichment and selection. On the bottom left, you can see an example of one such actomer. In this case, the general idea of what we were working with for our study. We were using a 76 base pair actomer with two predefined primer regions for amplification via PCR and this randomized 30 base pair region. So, what were our goals for our study? First off, we needed to find a target for uh, the run detection of coronavirus major capsid protein in populations. Using CELIX, we need to find binders for that bench of target, and then using those binders, we seek to develop a rapid detection assay that can be brought out into populations. So, quick roadmap of what we're going to be discussing over the course of this presentation. Uh, Aptimers to what we've just discussed was using aptomers to detect coronavirus. Uh, the testing of a previous student, Alyssa Angel's aptomers, <coughs> which we previously discovered before I joined this project. Uh, using CELIX to find new aptomers for the detection of coronavirus. Some of the complications I ran into during the CELIX process that we'll be getting into detail later. And the analysis of the final aptomer libraries that I generated. So, starting off with, uh, if you look over to you're right for everyone in the room. This probably looks like a pretty similar diagram to what you've seen throughout the course of today. Uh, this is the general map roadmap for a single selling cycle. You start off with a randomized library up here at the top. You attempt to bind it to your target protein or whatever you're trying to bind to. And anything that binds will stick to your target. Anything that doesn't is left free floating in the system. You can then remove anything unbound with a wash step or some other means and be left with just your target protein with anything that binds to it. Then, using some partitioning method, you can separate off your bound uh, aptomers from your target, reamplify them, and then start again from the top. So, to start off with, how do we get our target, uh, target protein? Our target protein is Ronavirus MCD, which is not commercially available. Uh, on top of this, we also need our target protein to have a GST tag for purposes of sticking it to a resin that we're using for selection and also for purifying it with its expression. A previous member of the project, the aforementioned Alyssa Angel, who also made some aptomers that we're we'll be talking about later, had generated and cloned a plasmid for this uh, GST tag MCP protein. So this is an example of the purification gel for one of those uh, purifications of coronavirus uh, GST MCP. In lanes 1 and 15, you can see the molecular ladder we use for sizing all of these bands. Lanes 2 and 3 contain the cell lysate from two different uh, expression pellets. 4 and 5 are the wa first wash for these pellets during the purification process. And 6 and 7 are the final wash for these. So the wash steps are removing anything that isn't relevant for our purification process. That's why it starts so heavily, so similar to the cell lysate. It's all the detritus, everything that isn't our protein. And six and seven is running it through a filter. Our protein gets stuck in the filter and showing that there's nothing that's running through the column, so it's just our protein stuck in the filter at that point. After that, we use some evolution agent to remove it from the said filter. And then 8 through 13 show different concentrations 
of the purified MCP. As when we initially ran this gel, we were unsure of the concentration of the protein and didn't want to risk including too much, blowing out the band, and being unable to identify the estimated size for said protein. Lane 14 on the right has a control MCP, giving us an idea of what our target protein should look like. So as you can probably assume from lanes 8 through 13 and comparing them to 14, our purification methods were able to successfully isolate and purify the GST tag MCP that we need for our target. So, I mentioned previously that Alyssa Angel generated some actimers using the target protein that we found. You might be wondering, did they bind? So before I go into if they bound, I want to talk about our screening method for testing binding. We used an electrophoretic mobility shift assay. The general principle of it is the gel on the right is made of agarose, and as you run samples through it, they'll get separated based off of their size. Uh, the example on the right showing that a single actimer is in lane A, runs very quickly through the gel because it's relatively small, doesn't get too hung up in the gel. When those actimers bind a protein, you'll notice that they shift upward in the gel, running slightly higher. You can use this to identify if there is binding between the actimers and a protein sample when you mix them beforehand and load them in. So, here are some of the gels from our screening. Uh, lanes three and four contain a thrombin actimer. Lane three control contains a thrombin actimer on its own, and four contains a thrombin actimer with uh, thrombin protein. You'll notice immediately that lane four has that upward shift we just talked about, indicating that the thrombin actimer is binding to the protein. On the right, you'll see a protein stain of the gel, giving us a rough estimate where the protein is running in the gel. So if there is binding, you can see where the protein should be running and where those bands should be. Lanes 5 through 10 contain some of the actimers that Alyssa generated, both either in or uh, without the presence of protein. And what you'll notice is that we're not seeing any upward shift between these actimers. Uh, you can see where the protein is running on the gel on the right and note that there are no bands corresponding to those protein bands in the left gel. So because actimers are single-stranded, we also had the thought, well, maybe we just have the wrong strand. Maybe if we use the complementary strand for these actimers, we'll see some binding. So we also screened those and unfortunately didn't see any binding with those either. So if we did Celex, why didn't we see any binding? So, the original Celex procedure that Alyssa used used uh, a two targeting models. It used virus selection, which attempts to bind actimers to whole virus particles, and MCP selection, which attempts to bind actimers to just the MCP that's found on the surface of the virus. We theorized that the reason we're not seeing any successful binders is that by changing the target between each round of Celex, anything that was able to successfully bind to either the whole virus or just the MCP wasn't able to successfully bind in the next round of selection, leading to the end result being a library that could very loosely bind to whatever the last target was. Uh, with this in mind, we needed to do Celex again to generate new actimers and hopefully find some strong binders. We selected to go forward with just the MCP selection because one, we had a met method of successfully generating the purified MCP, and also it's a lot safer for the environment if we don't have a bunch of coronavirus sitting in our lab at any one time. So, now we're going to start talking to some, about some of the problems I ran into during the selection process. The first problem came up with getting the actimers off of our bound protein. So, early elution conditions to get our actimers and protein out of the resin and ready to elute actimers for further enrichment use a concentrated glutathione buffer, which would force off any of the protein bound to our glass beads in our resin, uh, which worked fairly successfully in the early rounds, but starting at round four, we started to notice that a lot of the protein concentration wasn't actually coming off of our resin. So focusing in on, I did not highlight as well as I thought it would. Focusing in on these two columns, we're looking at the percent of protein depleted from our supernatant. So when we initially mix the protein with the resin, it's not 100% of the protein that's actually binding to the resin. We have some waste protein that's lost. Uh, in the far right column, you can see the percent of the input protein relative to what's coming off when we do the elution. You'll note that 
in almost all, in all of these rows, the combination of protein that's coming off during the initial binding and protein that we're getting off in the elution is not 100%. So we're not getting all of the protein onto the resin in the first place, and we're also not getting all of the protein off with our elution methods. So we needed some way of more reliably getting the protein off for the purposes of separating our aftermers and regenerating them for further rounds. So our, the solution we came to for this was using thermal elution not just to separate off the aptamers from the protein, but also to remove the protein from our resin by denaturing the protein as it is. So the gel down here at the bottom is highlighting a comparison between our GSH elution method and our thermal elution method. So lane three is a 10 micromolar positive control of a 76 mer aptamer. So this is where we should be seeing anything that does successfully come off of the resin. Lane four, as mentioned, is uh, the GSH elution method, which, as a quick reminder, is separating the protein off of the glass beads using a buffer, and then using thermal elution to get the aptamers off of the protein. You'll note that lane four is completely void of any band, meaning we're not getting any aptamers off of the protein there. Lane five, however, is that thermal elution method we're talking about. So instead of taking the resin and introducing an elution buffer first, we're just doing a thermal elution method from the start, denaturing both the aptamers and the protein all in one go. And that is giving us a band corresponding to roughly the right size for our aptamers. We were also curious if the elution buffer, buffer was affecting aptamers on their own. So lane seven contains sequence 16, which is a reference sequence we've been using for a while it's a 76 mer, like the Actimers we're working with, and we know it consistently shows up on our gels quite visibly. So it's our positive control in a lot of situations. Lane 6 contains sequence 16 with just the GSH buffer we were using. And as you can see, with the introduction of the buffer, the band corresponding to sequence 16 is completely gone. So something went off with our buffer. In the end, we've switched to a completely thermal illusion based method to get our actomers uh, off of our protein, and it's working successfully going forward. The second problem we ran into was the appearance of a byproduct during the PCR enrichment of the actomers to regenerate our library. So, early CellX rounds saw the formation of a byproduct bands during the enrichment. Round one shows a clean gel run. On the, le uh, on the left, you see round one, which shows a clean gel run. Round four is shown on the right, and if you look closely, you can see the formation of a small band right about here, corresponding to a byproduct. Uh, to remedy this, we tried a couple different means of approaching to uh, eliminate the byproduct formation. On the left, we tried changing primer concentrations to see how that would address the formation of the byproduct. Lane four over here contains our original uh, primer concentration, which was a 0.75 micromolar concentration of both primers. You can see the formation of the byproduct band at the top there. Lane seven contains that same primer concentration doubled. Uh, and you'll notice that while there is still the slight sign of a byproduct band, it's much less in comparison to our original one. Over in lane 10, you can see a three micromolar concentration of both primers. <coughs> and also note the complete elimination of any byproduct band. While this was a really good means of addressing the formation of a byproduct, it's also a lot of primer to be using in any run of PCR. So we also tried tweaking some other conditions for the PCR. Notably, uh, we tried lowering cycle, uh, lowering the rep number of cycles between uh, rounds, and also adding more stringent wash conditions during the actual selection methods. The comparison between our new updated PCR protocols and the previous PCR protocols can be shown on the right. Gel A is showing the previous methods, uh, and you'll note the formation of the byproduct band in lane four. B shows it with our updated conditions, including higher primer concentrations, more stringent wash conditions, and also lowered cycle count for each PCR, and almost the complete elimination of any byproduct. So, on to the third problem. Are we sure we're actually just getting single-stranded DNA from the PCR? Because as mentioned in the previous presentation, PCR generates a double-stranded product. We used lambda exonuclease digestion to address this. So 
one of our primers adds this phosphorylated tag to the PCR product. Lambda exonuclease, when added to these products, will digest that strand with the phosphorylated tag, leaving us with just the single strand of DNA. But we need to make sure that it's actually digesting everything and we're just getting our single strand of DNA product back. So, we used uh, a qubit DNA assay to identify the contamination of DSDNA. If you look at the graph on the right, you'll see a comparison between single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA in two different dyes that the qubit assay comes with. One is intended for single-stranded DNA and one is intended for double-stranded DNA. You'll note that the difference between the dyes isn't too significant on its own, but the thing we really want to call attention to is the difference between the double-stranded DNA and the single-stranded DNA of either dye. It's almost immediately noticeable that the presence of any double-stranded DNA causes a much stronger signal with these dyes than any amount of single-stranded DNA. Using this, we can create a, a, stand, a series of standards with different degrees of double-stranded DNA contamination to identify if any of the samples that we're getting out of our lambda exonuclease digestion have double-stranded DNA in them, and if so, about how much is present. So these three graphs show uh, rounds one, four, and seven uh, run through with these uh, double-stranded DNA contamination assays. The orange curve in all of them shows the standard curve, which is at, has samples of contamination at 0, 2.5, 5, 10, and 20% contamination. The blue dot corresponds to our sample. What you'll note in that all of these, almost all of these graphs, our SSDNA after being treated with the lambda exonuclease digestion uh, clocks in at less than 2.5% DSDNA contamination, so we can pretty confidently say there is no contamination between these rounds. You might note that in graph C that we have a slightly higher signal than the 2.5% DSDNA contamination. Uh, we theorize that the reason for this is because as we went further into the rounds, the amount of output DNA we're getting was at much higher concentrations than in previous rounds. So this increased signal is likely a result of just simply more single-stranded DNA in the sample. So, we've gone through all this process with the actual preparation of these samples. Now we need to figure out what we actually have after all the selection. So, we need to prepare these samples for Sanger sequencing. Uh, to do this, We've mixed them with a vector and grown them in E. coli in a similar manner to how we express our protein. To ensure the plasmids with our DNA are actually coming back with our DNA in the E. coli, we also ran PCR on the colonies after growth to confirm that we are seeing our 76 mer in the colonies that we're growing. So, after sending all these samples off for Sanger sequencing, we got a whole bevy of samples back, and a lot of them came back with garbage reads. In the end, we had 17 clean reads with which to do a bit of motif screening with. So, motif screening is looking for patterns in the 17 sequences we put through, trying to identify any commonalities between them. The slide that I have up here is showing the motif analysis for all 17 sequences. There's a couple important things to focus in on here. So, what's shown at the top is the actual motif analysis. Uh, the size of the letter gives you a rough estimate of the probability of any member at that point in the sequence of being that letter in the sequence. Of course, if there's only one letter, it's always that letter. If there's multiple letters, the size of the letter tells you it's more likely to be this or this. E value, which you see down here, represents the probability of any random sequence that is the same size as this motif as actually being that motif. P values represent your probability of finding another sequence uh, that is either a better or similar match to the sequence shown next to it. So E values of, of less than uh, 0, 5 are considered significant. While we do have an E value of less than 0, 5, you might be able to infer just based off of the actual motif that's being presented here that there isn't a lot of commonality between the sequences. But motif analysis doesn't just give you one motif for your input DNA. We noticed that another motif that came up showed two pairs of exact match, prime, of exact match actors. 
Uh, especially of note is in these two pairs, there's a lot of commonality between the first 12 uh, members, the first 12 bases of both of these sequences. So while overall our library might, might not have shown a huge amount of similarities between the two, we do have two sequences that stand out, most notably because these sequences are found in both early and later rounds of our Celex process. So these were generated early and were able to stick through selection processes, indicating that they must be, or at least are likely to be, strong binders for our target MCD. We also tried comparing our 17 unique sequences with some other commercially available aftermarks that we found for different ronavirus targets. Uh, notably, we compared them to a group of ronavirus aftermark, which we, we did note that there wasn't a lot of commonality between these two, understandable because while our ronavirus MCP is an MCP, grouper, ronavirus, and frog virus, they are targeting different organisms and thus have differences in them. Uh, we also screened them against two turtle actomers we found, and in a similar manner found that there wasn't a lot of similarity between our actomer libraries and these previously discovered turtle actomers. To get a better understanding of the actor of the duplicate pairs we did find, we went through with an RNA fold analysis, trying to get an idea of the secondary structure these actors form and hopefully bind to coronavirus MCP. A and B are the are a single member of both sets of pairs, uh, and you'll note that they have very similar overall structures, with those hairpin structures and the ladder structure that you can see joining them. Uh, also of note, we did the same for the grouper and turtle aftermers. Uh, the grouper aftermer is shown in C, has a somewhat similar structure despite not a lot of similarity in the sequence. Uh, the turtle aftermers, on the other hand, aren't too similar, but that's also understandable because, as you might be able to immediately tell just from the RNA fold analysis, the turtle aftermers are much longer sequences than our 76 ers So, proceeding forward, uh, student I was here is currently preparing more samples to be sent for sequencing and analysis with Adam Parker. Uh, Perla Huerta is currently beginning to screen uh, some of the identified sequences we've just been talking about. Following the identification of these sequences and confirmation that they are strong binders, we can start working on the design for the rapid assay kits, which in their current form are looking to be similar to a COVID test in which you'll be running a sample through these kits if they successfully bind, they'll get stuck in the kit and form a band, which will allow for easy identification and non-technical personnel to be able to immediately identify the, detect the presence of rhinovirus infection in the population. Important to note for these uh, test kits is that once we've succeeded in this process, you can use the Celex selection process to edit these kits for just about any potential target. So, as a quick recap, uh, ronavirus is a global threat that needs an efficient means of detection. An aftermer-based assay would seem to be the perfect fit for the needs of a field detection assay because it's stable and specific to its target. Uh, through the use of Celex, we have selected for a library of sequences that show evidence of specific binding to ronavirus MCP, and early sequencing results show an indication that we may have successful binders to ronavirus MCP. I'd like to thank my thesis committee, uh, Nina Godi, Dr. Kirsten Monston, Dr. Mark Poitner, and Julie Mugler for their assistance on this project. And I'd also like to thank the members of the project team, including Dr. Lisa Hazard, Adam Parker, Naima Zahir, and Perla Huerta, as well as previous students on the project, per, uh, Alyssa Angel, Stephanie Zapata, Mark Cyan, and Evelyn Bazan. I have an ecological question. So if you go out, you have like your test, and now you detect ranavirus in the environment, what is like the next step? Like, do you decimate the population? Do you, is there a treatment available? So there's no current treatment as mentioned. Uh, the general idea behind the detection assay is that you can use them to kind of monitor populations. If you find a population 
in the wild, it's kind of unfeasible to just completely quarantine or decimate the population because it can spread through the water. So the goal of these detection assays is that you can know, we've detected coronavirus here, we can monitor the population to see if the die-offs are increasing. Is there anything we can actually do about the die-offs? Like, can we dam up the area to try and prevent spread of the coronavirus infection? But the general idea for these kits is simply just detection. From there, it kind of becomes a situation of what can we do with that area. Um, first of all, nice job. Um, but in terms of like designing a, an assay to measure something in situ, are you measuring it in the water, or like do you have to like swab uh, uh, an animal? Like how, how would this be used, I guess, in in the future? Because you're not doing this work, obviously. Um, and also, like, what are the what are like quali quantitative metrics you need to be able to measure this stuff? Like, is one Protein in, you know, like, what are the concentration ranges that would be applicable for you to look at? Because I imagine, like, <coughs> if this thing is as wide, if this virus is as widespread as it, as it is, you might measure it everywhere, right? And then, just, yeah. So, uh, but again, these are future things. I know that you're not working on this, and it's just like, a, are you, what, what are the, so the current idea behind the detection asset kit is that you'd be able to swab either a, uh, an infected specimen, specimen and be able to use that swab for it, or be able to use the water because any infected creature that dies in the water will be releasing more virus. Uh, we also specifically chose the coronavirus MCP as our target because even if the whole virus isn't present in a population, if the virus has been in the population and has died off or has been destroyed by something, the protein which is encapsulating the virus should be somewhere in the water and should be detectable with a water sample test. Uh, as for concentrations, our initial screens were looking at uh, comparisons between one micromole of protein and one micromole of virus, but obviously this was just a much larger concentration to see if we could see binding in the first place. We don't have a strong idea of what kind of range we're going to be moving down to with the further work on the field test kits. Before we get down, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions about the, the experiment. Could you just show us the global distribution slide, please? Yes. It's somewhere in here. Here we go. Yeah. What strikes me about this is just how diverse the habitats are that you're, you're seeing this virus. It's, it's mind-blowing. You about, um, so as we look in different types of habitats, are we, as we go for different temperature zones, are we seeing different variations of this virus, or it seems to be consistent from one location to the other? We are seeing different uh, variations of the virus. This map is just a global, di the different variations of the virus and where they've been detected. As mentioned, the specific one we were looking at was frog virus 3, which right. we've only really been detecting on the eastern U.S. coast, but okay. of course there are other species that are more prevalent elsewhere. Is there any chance this aptamer might be selectively binding to the GST path? So that was an initial thought we had, and it's not something I brought up during the presentation. During the selection process, we have a counter-selection round every three rounds. During this round, we run another GST tagged protein through the selection process to see anything that binds to that is that's made it through previous rounds is ideally going to be binding to the GST tag, or maybe the glass beads, or maybe something in the buffer and is getting removed during that selection step before we take it back and then attempt to rebind it with the GST tag coronavirus MCP. Thank you. Do you know how the initial, um, the non-randomized regions of your aptamer were chosen? Because if you look at the, uh, the sequences that popped up, like the, the duplicate sequence that you had, there's a whole lot of C's 
in there, but not necessarily any genes that would kind of solve <laughs> deal with it. So it makes me think that there's a lot of genes in your other regions. So our primer sequences, if I remember correctly, were based off of the primer sequences initially found by Alyssa. But the thing to bring up is that the sequencing results that we're putting in here were when screening against our own 17 duplicate sequences, we called the primer sequences on both ends because we knew there would be an exact match and any sequence analysis would suddenly be skewed by Here are these, here's these two exact matches on all 17 sequences we put through. So at least for these first two slides, we're simply looking at the randomized M30 region in every single one of the actinomers with both of the primer ends cut off. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I was just wondering how those prior regions, I guess, were chosen in the first place, because in the end, they inevitably have some role in binding or the self-annealing. Um, uh, like, as mentioned, they were selected by Alyssa, as far as I know, so I'm not too certain on the familiarity with them, but I can always look back through our research and see, uh, get back to you on those. Any further questions? Oh boy. <laughs> Start with you, Dr. Atten. You know me. It's, it's my job to ask the, the big picture stupid questions because I'm a physiological ecologist and I don't do this stuff. Um, so we're using aptamers as a tool, right? These short strands of DNA that we're using as a tool because they'll fold into confirmation, select the blind and all that. What just occurred to me listening to this in a previous presentation, do we find aptamers in naturally occurring systems? Do they show up in cells? And if so, what do they do? I remember correctly from my initial research into aptamers. Aptamers are almost exclusively artificially formed. You're only really going to get them through lab production, through selection techniques like this. They're not particularly a natural result as any situation where we need a single stranded DNA sequence in the cell, we typically use something like RNA for it. Okay, thanks. Dr. Monson? So let's jump ahead in time. Okay. Okay, um, and right now, Right, there's NGS work going on with, based on, on what you've been doing. Let's assume it's a smashing success, and we find aptamers that are high, you know, we have repetitive sequences, we see a, a lot of the same thing coming up, and they bind really, really well to MCV. The aptamers that you found now, are those going to work in a detection assay a year from now, five years from now? Or are we constantly going to have to re-screen for new aptamers? So the current idea is that we'll prob we probably will need to update the detection assay going forward as the virus w is constantly adapting with time. We specifically chose the MCP protein because it's one of the few regions of the virus that we've noted is conserved between the many different uh, samples of the virus that we've taken. So hopefully, we can go several years without needing to redo the selection, but we will have to redo selection at some point to make new aptamers for the detection of the virus. This is my last one, I swear. <laughs> why then, why, I know why we chose MCP, but why is it conserved? Like, what is adaptive about that protein being conserved to a virus? It's adaptive. Hmm. Think like a virus. I've thought about this one. <laughs> What, is the, what does that protein do? What's its function? The purpose of that protein is to protect the viral DNA inside of the envelope. So I would assume then that the reason that it's so conserved is because it's kind of specialized to protecting the virus from outside sources. If it changes too much, it no longer uh, succeeds at its job. Absolutely. And then what would happen to the virus? It would get destroyed and we would no longer have to worry about detecting that virus. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did you, you have a question, Dr. White? Yeah, forgive me if this is a silly question because I don't really know about this. So this seems to be like, what what is in that library? Is it like a commercial library of things that are known to bind to these proteins and you just see what sticks at that time? So that library is, we uh, contacted IDT and asked for them to give us 
is 76 merge sequence with these two defined regions, and then told them that anything in that 30 region can be any uh, nucleotide whatsoever. We just need a 76 merge that matches, uh, that, that is recognizable as single-stranded DNA, and that that 30 region can be completely randomized. So it was commercially purchased, but it wasn't a like off the shelf. This is a randomized library from so and so. It was it was custom made for us. So the number of possibilities there is huge, right? Yes. <coughs> This, this actually ties into that very nicely, um, and this is me being maybe clueless again. Um, if we wanted to say, say we isolate something, we've got a good sequence and it works. If we wanted to refine that, can we request a library that uses that as a starting point? We could, in fact, start with, uh, as mentioned in the previous presentation, we could, in a way, work backwards from something we already have to find more potential bindings using the same selection process. Ideally, anything that would come out of that would be even stronger binders than what we're starting with. But uh, it has been noted that too many rounds of Celex can result in ultimately the library being less effective at binding to its target due to overcycling and other impurities showing up through the selection process. But instead of doing Celex, can we ask who can, I guess, can we request a sort of randomly generated library but that uses our sequence as its starting point somehow, like they're synthesizing from that and making mutations, essentially. You know, can, can we artificially mutate our aptamer and then select again? I, I would say we most likely can start, back, start with those and mutate off and see if we find any better binders for that. As we saw from this duplicate pair, if one of these is a good binder, then reasonably the other one is, and we've got this whole other region on from 13 base pairs on in that randomized region that we could mutate to see if we can get even better binding out of the sequences. One last question. Um, when you show the structures of, of like the successful aptamers, those are not those don't include those are not bound to the protein. Correct. So then do you have an idea of what they look like? Because the, I mean size wise this is like I can't remember maybe there's a better question. For you the size wise is like a, a few nanometers I suppose, right? Ish. A couple of nanometers for one of these? Something? And how big is the protein? How big is the protein? The protein one? is, I believe it's in the 60 kilodalton range for sizing. So, like, length units, it's like much bigger than this, right? Much, yes. much, much. And so, it's binding to only a small region of that? Yes. Protein, and then for detecting it, I can hear you spread or something like that, or for labels. How would like how would the detection or you can like how would it detect how would that you actually use this to detect something? Because like you have to like you need some like physical change in the environment to do <coughs> something measurable, right? Yeah. How would work? So as mentioned, the current thought, which probably is going to need to go through a lot of refining, is that we were going to use them in a similar manner to antibodies in like a the, the COVID test. But as you mentioned, they are much smaller than our protein, so we might have to look into a different approach, like maybe instead of using the rapid detection assay in that form, we might start with the sample and be manually adding in uh, the aptamers with some other fluorescent agent or some other agent so that we can see an immediate change in the sample when the aptamers successfully bind. <coughs> For other aptamers, you mentioned the, <coughs> the earliest one, the frondin. Are there crystal structures of these things? Uh, I didn't do too much studying into the thrombin. The thrombin was uh, actually more talk focused on the previous discussion, but we did use it as control. Um, I'm unsure if there's actual actually crystal structures on the thrombin aptamers. I'd have to assume with the amount of time it's been around, someone's done a study on how they bind to the protein. Right. But uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any of them in any of the research I've done. It's definitely something that would be worth looking into for this project to get a better idea. I have just a curious thought. Um, could you use these aptamers actually as inhibitors of like binding, protein-protein binding, or even inhibit enzymatic reactions? So one of the initial thoughts we had when going down this project was 
it's possible that while binding, they do have some effect on the efficiency of the virus, or they could be used to inhibit the protein. The other thought is, if you attach them to a larger molecule, you could also use them as a delivery agent for something. You could attach the actomer to, say, a protein that we know does inhibit the virus in some way, and use this as the means of detecting and delivering said inhibitor to the virus. Yeah, but, but just to follow up on that, uh, so you, going back to the thrombin afternoon, does it, do you know if it affects thrombin activity? That, it's an enzyme, right? Ah. Uh, they must have looked at that. Like, I'm saying, but. We didn't do too much look, uh, looking into the actual enzyme activity because early stages were looking into just the binding. The right. looking into the, F, the effects on the actual protein were thought to come later once we found things that we do know bind to begin with. No, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I get you know, this is a whole different focus, you know. Does it does inhibit. Okay, what? It does inhibit. The front of it. Yeah. Okay. It's a Any further questions?